Hello, everyone, and welcome to the College Admissions Collaborative Highlighting Engineering and Technology Virtual College Fair. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. Just a few housekeeping items before we do get started. There is a Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, which you can use to ask questions at any time during the session. Your camera and microphone are turned off, so the panelists cannot see or hear you. And this is just one of many sessions happening. There's an additional hour after this, so definitely check that out as well. And this presentation is being recorded and will be available by tomorrow at the same site where you're registered. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists for this session from Florida Institute of Technology. All right. Let me share my screen here. Thanks, folks. Uh, my name is Mike Perry. I'm the Executive Director of Admissions, and I'm uh, for the university, and I'm joined by David Moody, who's my assistant director of admissions, and we're uh, going to talk to you about uh, this great university, Florida Institute of Technology. Um, as uh, Clarissa mentioned, if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and type them into the uh, the Q and A. Uh, Dave will try to answer them as we go, and then we'll save some for the end uh, that we may uh, answer live for the good of the group and so forth. So let me get going here. Okay, so for those not familiar uh, with where we're located, we are uh, Florida Institute of Technology is located in East Central Florida, about halfway down the state, right on the East Coast in Melbourne, Florida, just south of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we, we were actually established and founded by a bunch of NASA engineers and scientists when they were first uh, in the late 50s, when they were first establishing Cape Canaveral and what's now the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, there was no Institute of Higher Education uh, in the area. So some senior engineers and scientists started uh, Florida Institute of Technology to kind of further the education of all the early scientists and engineers uh, in the space program. And we've grown a lot from that in the last uh, 62 years. Uh, and it's just an absolutely uh, wonderful place to live and learn. We're surrounded by all the companies uh, that support NASA, uh, companies like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and uh, United Launch Alliance and Boeing and SpaceX. Uh, we're about four miles from the Atlantic Ocean and uh, two miles from the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, and if I could pan my camera right now outside my office, uh, you'd see it's just absolutely gorgeous out. Uh, so wonderful place to live and learn. Uh, our students come from all 50 states and over 110 countries around the world. Um, we have on our main campus here, we, we offer undergraduate and graduate degrees. We have about 3,500 undergraduate students and about 5, 000, or 2,000 graduate students. So about 5,500 students uh, on the main campus. We are a private university. We also have 13 off-campus graduate sites uh, that do master's and doctoral level degrees. Uh, and then we have our Florida Tech online division, which does undergraduate and graduate degrees. Uh, but the online division focuses mainly on the non-STEM type majors, the, the business and the psychology and the healthcare management, uh, things along that uh, nature. Uh, our off-campus sites uh, together, they, they have about another 4,000 students enrolled, uh, but on the main campus, about 5,500 uh, from all over the world. Uh, and we offer a lot. Uh, there, there's over 187 different degree programs at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, that's offered through this university. Um, the university is divided into four colleges. Uh, we have a College of Aeronautics, a College of Business, a College of Engineering and Science, and a College of Psychology and Liberal Arts. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on all these on the uh, next upcoming slides. Uh, I, I would tell most people uh, that without a doubt, a majority of our students are studying some type of STEM major here. And so our College of Engineering and Science is the largest and hosts about 75% of our student body at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, we're considered a, a tier one national doctoral granting research university. Uh, that's our Carnegie classification that puts us in the upper tier of all colleges and universities, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, so we have some pretty good accolades with that. Uh, and and uh, you'll see as we go through the programs, we, we offer some very unique things uh, uh, that attracts students, to, uh, not only to this university, but this, uh, this part of the United States. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna go through each college one by one, give you a little highlights on them. Uh, our College of Aeronautics, we have one of the larger collegiate aviation programs in the United States. Uh, uh, there's another school in Florida and one up in North Dakota uh, uh, that are about comparable size uh, for that. Um, students within our College of Aeronautics, uh, uh, typically want to work somewhere in the aviation industry, uh, whether they want to be a professional pilot uh, or 
uh, fly for a corporation or start their own business or work in management at an airport or for an airline or work for the FAA or air traffic control or the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, all of our degree programs pretty much prepare students to work anywhere within the aviation industry. Most of the students are here taking one of these uh, functional majors here uh, and then are taking our flight training option. We have a fleet of 40 aircraft uh, and they're located at Melbourne International Airport. We do our own, uh, have our own maintenance facilities. Uh, and so most students within this program are, are completing flight training all the way up through uh, restricted ATP. And they have a background in things like aeronautical science or aviation management and really sets them up for a career anywhere within the aviation industry. Uh, it's absolutely uh, wonderful. Uh, our students start flying right away. Uh, they don't have to have any prior flight experience prior to getting here. Uh, and in fact, any, any student in any academic major here, if they want to learn how to fly, uh, they could tack that on to their degree program uh, and take flight training as part of their degree. Uh, it's not required to graduate uh, unless you're within one of the flight programs. Uh, but it is available to all students uh, for that. So it's, uh, it's about as hands-on as you can get uh, in the STEM field. And it's a, a really great place to, to fly. We have over 300 great uh, days of weather per year that you can fly uh, under. Um, <clears throat> go to the next slide here. Our College of Business, a lot of uh, uh, students may not associate an Institute of Technology with a co College of Business, but we have some of the best ones uh, in the United States, and, and we do bachelor's, master's, and also a doctorate in business administration here. Uh, and so uh, generally students may come here for a degree in business administration, but they can get concentrations at the undergraduate level uh, if you're interested in like sport management or marketing uh, or entrepreneurship. Um, it, uh, studying accounting here and finance are also very popular. If you're, if you're in an accounting degree program, uh, it will prepare you for all the requirements that you need to become a, a CPA or a certified public accountant uh, and so forth. Uh, what's great about this program also is our location uh, because we're surrounded by all these large corporations that support NASA. Um, you know, they, they have a, an oversight of our College of Business where they provide mentor, mentorship and internships to business students that wanna work in big business and, and they help uh, the university, you know, keep the curriculum updated on things that are needed within uh, uh, the industry of business. So great place to, to study business administration. Now here it is, engineering. Uh, uh, our College of Engineering, I got two slides because it's so big. Uh, I, I would clearly say that about half, about 50% uh, of the students uh, coming to this university are studying some type of engineering. Uh, and again, we offer it at the bachelor's, the master's, and the doctorate level. Uh, without a doubt, uh, I, I tell people that our two most popular majors at this university are aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering. Uh, I think it's because of our location and our relationship uh, with the Space Center, uh, but also it's just outstanding and, and they thoroughly prepare students uh, to become professional engineers uh, and, and have successful careers, be leader, leaders in, in, in that type of industry. Uh, other things that are uh, incredibly popular are things like computer science, computer engineering, software engineering. Uh, we do degrees in cybersecurity. Um, biomedical engineering uh, it has grown tremendously in popularity and needs in industry and so forth. Uh, uh, so they're all really popular programs and, and phenomenal facilities and, and great opportunities uh, to get actual uh, practical uh, hands-on uh, experience or experiential learning through that. Science, uh, we offer all the, uh, the pure sciences most people uh, hear about like biology, chemistry, and physics, but we're also well known for some very specialized sciences that you're not going to find at most institutions in the United States. Uh, we were the first university ever to have a space sciences program. Uh, and we have five astronauts that, that are uh, alumni. We have uh, uh, three that are on faculty here. Uh, and so um, offering things like astrobiology and astronomy and astrophysics and, and planetary science and even meteorology, uh, you're not going to find at uh, a lot of institutions, but you certainly find it here at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, if you want to be one of those people that goes search for life on Mars, uh, you know, come here and study astrobiology because that's exactly what they do. Uh, you know, if you want to 
um, uh, uh, whether you want to be a professional meteorologist and, and, and broadcast meteorology on TV or whether you want to work for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration or, or for NASA itself, become a meteorologist. Just great opportunities. Um, biological sciences is very popular here. Uh, I tell uh, most people that our most popular biological science is marine biology. You won't find that at most institutions either. Uh, and in fact, we offer all the marine sciences. Uh, there's lots of different disciplines. And so marine biology, marine conservation, oceanography, ocean engineering, um, uh, environmental science, they're all offered here. They're all marine sciences, uh, but they're different in discipline. Our location uh, next to the Indian River Lagoon, uh, which is one of the most diverse ecological systems in North America, it just makes it an ideal location to, to study the marine sciences. Uh, then being close to the beach is, is, is pretty good too. So great sciences here, some very specialized areas uh, that you can get into. Uh, the thing <clears throat> that I don't have super highlighted here, uh, uh, but we certainly offer is uh, pre-medical degrees. And so pre-med uh, is popular here. You can uh, study any of a number of degrees uh, that you can use as a pre-med degree to prepare you to go on to medical school. And so the most popular is biomedical science, uh, but you can study biomedical science, biomedical engineering, uh, pre-medical chemistry, pre-medical physics, genomics and molecular genetics, and all of them would meet all the requirements as a pre-med degree. Uh, and then we have uh, specific faculty uh, that are professionals that, that help prepare you to go on to medical school if that's what you want to do uh, and so forth. So a lot of pathways for medical school here also. Uh, on our softer side, we have a College of Psychology and Liberal Arts. Uh, uh, some uniquenesses is, is we have one of the larger autistic research centers in North America. It's called the Scott Center for Autism Research. It's right here on our campus. Uh, and so um, very popular within our, our College of Psychology and Liberal Arts is students that are studying applied behavioral analysis, ABA. Those are people that wanna work with other people that may be on the autism spectrum uh, and, and so forth. And it's a, a great degree at both the undergraduate and graduate level, probably our most popular within our, our College of Psychology and very uh, close to that would be forensic psychology, things like that, or you could just get regular degrees, bachelor's of science or bachelor's of arts in psychology under the behavioral sciences. Uh, since this is a cache engineering STEM type uh, presentation, I won't talk too much on this, but we offer liberal arts degrees in communications and journalism uh, and humanities. In fact, you can uh, use these as majors, you can double major, or you can minor in any of these type of programs while you're getting an engineering or science degree. Uh, we also have a music department, and where we don't offer degrees in music, we offer minors in music. So you can't get a bachelor's degree in music, but you can minor in it. And if you have a passion for music, you can certainly, you know, continue that passion here uh, while you're studying uh, uh, whatever academic field that you're in. Uh, something that's just simply outstanding here is our opportunities for cooperative education and internships. You know, that's how people get jobs and, they, and how they participate in experience what we call experiential learning. Uh, we offer both here. Uh, you may have heard of the term internships. Uh, you know, that's where you go work for a company in your field of study um, and you get some practical experience. Uh, it usually lasts about a semester long. Uh, we'll probably get more uh, aviation and business and psychology students that would do a one semester internship. And we'll get our engineering students uh, that will uh, typically do what's called cooperative education. And what co-op is, is it, it's multiple internships where you go for more than one semester. And in essence, you're kind of alternating a semester of academic work with a semester of work in your field of study. Uh, and the thing about co-ops is they're guaranteed paid positions. So you actually get paid for doing this. Uh, and, and so the way we have it set up is you can, you can get three of these semesters of, of paid work experience in your field of study and still graduate in four years. You're alternating work uh, with academics and uh, it works out pretty well. I would tell you that about 
70 to 75% of our engineering students participate in cooperative education and over 90% of them have job offers from the company they co-op with before they even have a bachelor's of science degree. So great way to get your foot in the door and get some practical experience. It's offered to all students. Uh, another cool thing here is because we do bachelor's, master's and doctoral level degrees, um, uh, students have the opportunity to fast track through the degree programs and get a bachelor's and a master's degree in five years, as opposed to six plus years uh, that you may find at other institutions. So a bachelor's of science degree typically takes four years to complete here. A master's is two years and, and a PhD is two plus years, depending on what type of research you're doing. But students, if they're good students, um, have the opportunity um, to fast track that and get, get a bachelor's and a master's in five years. And the way they do that uh, is they have to qualify. And the way you qualify is, is, is having a good grade point average, a 3.3 grade point average or higher at the end of your junior year while you're in college. If you have that, they allow you to take graduate level courses your senior year that count for both your undergraduate degree and your graduate degree. So by the time you finish four years and have your bachelor's degree, you only have one more academic year left to complete a master's degree. So a lot of students take advantage of that. You know, the students that graduate with uh, master's level degrees, uh, you know, typically start out with higher than normal average starting salaries uh, and, and they're greatly employable. Uh, our College of Business uh, has phenomenal opportunities to, to fast track and, and get a bachelor's in three years or get a bachelor's and an MBA in four years or, or, or five years. So depending on how much advanced standing credit you come in, uh, to the university with, uh, there's great opportunities to accelerate uh, your degree completions uh, with the College of Business too. We'll talk a little bit more about advanced standing credit uh, coming up here shortly. Okay, Oops, sorry. Another big thing is, is research and design. Uh, students cannot graduate uh, from Florida Institute of Technology and get a degree without having participated participated in either research or engineering design. And so if you're a science major, you have to do research at the undergraduate level. It's part of your curriculum. If you like doing that type of stuff, you, you can start as early as your first year on campus. Um, if you're an engineering student, you can't get out of here without learning how to design and actually build something. That's what engineers do. They build things to, to better humanity, right? And all different types of uh, disciplines. And so uh, as a minimum, our students have to do what's called a senior design project. And so uh, there's no rogue engineer out there that works by themselves. So they work in teams. And so you may be an aerospace engineer working with a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, or a computer scientist or a physics major. Uh, and you go from a concept uh, to uh, coming up with the design to actually building these devices. And uh, they do some amazing things uh, that would just uh, knock your socks off. They, we build robots here. We build rockets here. We build airplanes here. We build build Formula One race cars. We build jet dragsters here. Uh, all sorts of uh, different things. And if you like doing that type of stuff, you don't have to just do a senior design project. You start doing that as soon as you get here. It's a very hands-on university. Uh, the other thing, uh, as we go forward here, uh, well, let me talk about athletics and then I'm going to circle back and, and talk about some uniquenesses of our degrees too as we talk about uh, admissions. Um, for those interested in athletics, we're NCAA Division II. We compete in the Sunshine State Conference. We have 18 different uh, varsity sports, both men and women. Uh, we've had uh, some famous alums, you, you know, anybody uh, from the New England area, if you know who Tim Wakefield was, he's the, the knuckleballer for the Red Sox. He's a Florida Tech alum. He played first base for us and has a degree in engineering from Florida Institute of Technology. Uh, we've had uh, people and crew go on to the Olympics and, and, and uh, achieve gold and silver medals. Uh, uh, you know, we've had uh, national championships in soccer. Uh, uh, and we've had na national championships in, in Division II women's golf. Uh, so just some phenomenal uh, opportunities here. So uh, athletics is here. Um, and if you're, if you're a student athlete and you want to uh, participate in sports, we get you in contact with our coaches uh, and our athletic departments. Uh, they are the ones that determine any participation in uh, uh, NCAA sports and, and who gets a scholarship and who doesn't get a scholarship on the team and things like that. Uh, but great opportunities here. 
Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the admissions process while we have some time. Uh, I'm not sure what level everybody is, but if uh, uh, if you if you haven't applied for admissions, Florida Tech, we operate on what's called a rolling admissions basis, which means you can apply any time throughout your senior year. We don't have a designated deadline to get an application in. We're still receiving applications right now for fall 2021. Um, we get a, uh, you'll see on the next slide, we get about 11,000 applications a year. Uh, you can apply to us either through the Common App or Common App School, or uh, you can just go to our website and, and hit the apply button and you can apply through the university uh, online application. Um, when you apply for admissions, we require transcripts. Uh, we are not a test optional school. I know a lot are nowadays. Uh, we do require an SAT or ACT uh, test results. Uh, or if you take the test multiple times, we'll super score uh, those results. Uh, we do realize that, hey, during a, a pandemic, if, if some students don't have the opportunity uh, to take the test because testing centers are closed down, we'll work with you. Um, we can review you without test scores uh, if we need, if you've tried, you've been shut out of taking tests. But if you have the opportunity to take the test, take them. Uh, they help give us a, another indication of your potential for success along with your transcripts, and they help us determine uh, merit scholarship levels and things like that. I put on this slide, uh, essays, letters of recommendation, uh, those are optional. Uh, and so when we receive common applications, most of them already have essays and letters of recommendation attached to them and we'll certainly look at them, uh, but that uh, is not gonna hold up your application uh, for review uh, if we have an application in your transcripts and test scores. Um, essays, um, uh, most people will write about whatever they're passionate about, okay? Uh, and letters of recommendation, the best ones usually come from teachers who can advocate for you in areas that you're interested in. So if, uh, 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 if you're going into engineering or science, get your math or science teacher to write your letter of recommendation and that will be good. But again, those are optional uh, and, and so forth. So uh, we get about 11,000 applications per year. Uh, we admit about 60% of them. You can see what the average uh, grade point average in the, in the mid 50% SAT range and mid ACT composite ranges. Uh, we do super score. So if you take the SAT multiple times, we'll use your highest math and your highest evidence-based reading and writing. Uh, if you've taken the ACT multiple times, we'll super score that too and use your highest uh, four sub scores and, and create a, uh, an ACT super score composite for you. Um, Another uniqueness about this university, and, and it may be similar at some of the other cache schools uh, that you may listen to on their presentations, is we directly admit students into academic majors. Um, that is very different than about 90% of the colleges and universities in the United States. You know, at most schools in the United States, when you apply for admissions, if you get accepted, you get accepted to the institution. And then for the first two years, you take what's called general education requirements. Uh, and then you apply for a major, get accepted into the major, and you're gonna study that the last two years. That's not the case here at Florida Institute of Technology. You know, if you apply for admissions, you declare what your major is on your application. So if you tell us you wanna be an aerospace engineer, we accept you directly into aerospace engineering and, and you start studying aerospace engineering as soon as you get here freshman year, and you're gonna study it all four years. OK, and so when you apply, how we look at an applicant for engineering and science is different than how we look at an applicant for business or psychology, simply because the math and science background that you have to have for engineering and science is a little bit more rigorous. All right. So if you're interested in any of the STEM programs, science and engineering, you want to have a good math and science background. That's what carries the most weight in our application process. What math level have you achieved? You know, what was available to you and, and what did you take and how did you uh, um, uh, accelerate there? Uh, what sciences did you take? We'd like to see math through the pre-calculus level at least. We like to see sciences, the pure sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics uh, done in high school. Uh, and we like to see decent grades, A's and B's. We don't like to see D's and F's, right? So good grades in uh, good math and science uh, background uh, and that, that will set you up for success uh, applying to Florida Institute of Technology. And know that you get admitted directly into your major and you start studying it right away. Uh, we don't get a lot of undecided students, uh, but we do get some that say, hey, I'm interested in engineering, but I don't know what 
discipline of engineering. And so we have some one year or first year exploratory programs in general engineering and general science. So if you know you wanna be an engineer, but you're not sure what type, uh, you could say general engineering for the first year and you'll get introduced in that first year to all the different engineering disciplines. But at the end of your first year, you have to say, hey, I wanna be a civil engineer or I wanna be a computer engineer or an aerospace engineer, whatever it may be. You can do the same with the sciences because uh, a lot of the first year level courses in engineering and science are the same. Students come in here and they're typically expected to take calculus, calculus-based physics, chemistry, English composition, and then introductory courses in their field of study, engineering or science, um, that first year uh, as soon as they get here. Okay, uh, I told you I'd talk a little bit about advanced standing credit. We get a lot of questions about this and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you have, uh, we accept advanced standing credit and there's uh, different ways that you can uh, receive some advanced credit. If you are enrolled in any advanced placement classes and you take the AP exam at the end, in general, if you score a four or a five on AP examinations, you'll get advanced standing credit for whatever that subject matter is. Our only exception to that is English composition. If you're in, in any of the AP English composition courses and get a three or higher, three, four or five, you can get advanced standing credit for English composition. Everything else you need a, a four or five. Uh, we also get students that are in high school enrolled in international baccalaureate programs. Uh, and there's different options there. If somebody's completing an IB diploma, if they're an IB diploma candidate and they get awarded the diploma, it's equivalent to about 30 semester credit hours of college work, almost your whole first year uh, worth of work if you're an IB diploma awardee. Um, some students are enrolled in international baccalaureate courses and they're not diploma candidates, but they plan on taking these higher level IB examinations. And if you're in that category uh, and you just take the higher level IB examinations, if you score a four or higher on the IB exams, four, five, six, or seven, you'll get advanced standing credit for whatever that subject matter is. Um, we also get a lot of students, especially in Florida, that are participating in uh, the ACE uh, program, or what, you know, it's the same as the British Cambridge examinations. And so if you're, if you're in one of those type of curriculums where, where it falls under the British Cambridge system and you're, you're taking the, the, the advanced level exams at the end, you can get advanced standing uh, credit depending on what your scores are, are on those uh, Cambridge exams. And then we get a lot of uh, students that are dual enrolled, uh, that they're enrolled in a, a either a local community college or a state college at the same time that they're enrolled in high school. Uh, some students are trying to complete an associate of arts degree while they're finishing up their high school diploma. Some are just taking a few classes. Uh, we see it all. Uh, and that's good too. And, and so you can get some transfer credit for uh, programs or classes that you're dual enrolled in while you're in high school. We need a copy of that transcript from that college. Uh, even if it's listed on your high school transcript, we still need a separate official transcript from the, the college or university that you're attending. And it, you have to have a grade of C or better. As long as it's an accredited institution and you have a grade of C or better, uh, you'll get transfer credit for it. Uh, and then once you have all this credit in, uh, our academic departments here will determine, well, how do those credits apply toward your degree completion? You know, which one of them, which, which ones of them fit in, you know, an aerospace engineering degree or a business degree or a, a marine biology degree? We'll determine that. You just get us all the, the documents and paperwork and, and we'll help you through that. And then the question we get also is about prior flight experience, because we do have uh, students that come here that, that, uh, are in our College of Aeronautics and they want to learn how to fly. And some of them already have some flight experience. They may have a private pilot license or an instrument rating, a commercial license, uh, and that's fine. Uh, we have to do an evaluation uh, once you get here. Uh, we'll put you through a flight check. We'll look at your log book. We'll make you take a written exam. And based on that uh, evaluation, you can get some advanced standing credit for your prior flight certificates and ratings. Uh, and it, how much you get depends on what you have and, and what your skill level is once you get here. Uh, but typically, a private pilot license is worth about five semester hours uh, worth of credit at the college level here, as long as you pass all the, uh, um, all the exams or, and screening once you get here. Okay, uh, what's most important out of all this is how successful our graduates are, and they are very successful. 
you know, students going into STEM fields, I would tell you without a doubt, uh, have a, among the highest placement rates in the United States right now. Uh, and so I hope you're interested in these type of fields uh, to go into. Uh, at Florida Tech, uh, our, our placement rate is 95%. In fact, this year, I think it's hovering more like at 96%. That means that 95, 96% of our, our graduates are either employed or they're in graduate school at graduation or within the first six months of graduation. That is really high compared to the national average. You know, the national average at most colleges and universities is 56%, and we're sitting at 96%. Our, our graduates get jobs and they get well paying jobs. Uh, in fact, we have some of the highest average starting salaries in the United States for our graduates uh, and mid career salaries, you know, as they kind of move up the chain after graduation. Uh, and they get hired by some big name companies. Um, NASA is here all the time. Uh, all those companies I mentioned before, uh, you can see a very short list uh, here on the screen. Uh, and we have a great career management service office that, that uh, helps our students. Uh, if they don't already have job offers by the time they get to graduation, um, they will help set up interviews. Uh, they will help prep a, a, a graduate or um, you know, an upcoming graduate uh, for job and career opportunities uh, as they become available. And they're very, very successful at it. So we have a whole dedicated team to that, uh, but the students themselves and what they do in their degree program, uh, the research and the engineering projects that they participate in uh, really set themselves up for success. Uh, and, uh, and so our graduates have good reputations out there. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about financial aid for a few minutes. Uh, as a private institution, uh, you know, we cost a little bit more than a, than a state uh, or public uh, run uh, college or university, but we offer a lot more financial aid. Uh, you can see on this slide that about 97, I think right now we're running 98% of our students receive some type of financial assistance. And you can see what the average financial aid uh, package was uh, just this last year. Uh, it was in excess of $33,500 per year. And so financial aid is a packaging process where we take university aid and we offer scholarships and grants. We combine Florida state aid if you're a Florida resident and we combine federal aid into a package uh, to help you uh, afford your education and so forth. And there's just absolutely great opportunities. What we need you to do is one, apply for admissions and get accepted and then file a FAFSA, a free application for uh, federal student aid. We're gonna automatically evaluate you for university-based uh, scholarships when you apply for admissions. There's no separate application for that. And so you may get offered at the time of admissions, a Panther Fund scholarship you know, uh, from the university. And, and those are gonna be based on merit. They're gonna be based on your weighted grade point average and your SAT or ACT test results. But that's only one portion of an overall financial aid package. We also offer grants and, and grants are gift aid too. If you get awarded a scholarship or a grant, you don't have to pay them back, they're free money. So whenever you hear the term scholarships and grants, you wanna latch on to it, right? They don't have to be repaid. But the way you get them is for different reasons. And so scholarships are usually based on merit, grade point averages, SAT, ACT scores, things like that. Grants are usually based on a financial need, a talent, or an incentive. And what happens more often than not is uh, a majority of our students have a combination of scholarships and grants uh, from the university and then from other sources outside the university that are part of a, a, an overall financial aid package. Uh, uh, another difference between scholarships and grants are the renewal criteria. If you get offered a scholarship uh, here or at any institution, you usually have higher renewal criteria, which means in order for that scholarship to get renewed every year, you typically have to maintain a certain grade point average. And so at Florida Tech, if we offer you a merit-based scholarship, you got to maintain a 2.6 cumulative grade point average, and it automatically gets renewed every year till you get to graduation, okay? Now, if you fall below a 2.6 grade point average for one semester, not to worry, there's a one semester grace period for you to get it back up uh, uh, and so forth and, and, and maintain your scholarship. Grants, on the other hand, are free money, but they typically have lower renewal criteria. And so any grant that you hear about from the university, a state or the federal government, you only have to maintain satisfactory academic progress. And that's a 2.0 grade point average. 
So if you get a grant, as long as you maintain a 2.0 cumulative grade point average or higher, it automatically gets renewed. Uh, so keep in mind that these packages are, are just that, they're packages. They're a combination of scholarships and grants. They may be outside um, uh, resources. They may, may be sources from the state or, you know, state of Florida or the federal government, all combined into this overall package. Uh, Florida Tech, uh, because I mentioned we're NCAA Division II, we also do athletic scholarships. Division I and Division II schools uh, offer athletic scholarships. Uh, and like I said, th those are determined uh, uh, by the coaches of whatever the particular sport that you play in. Um, we have Army ROTC on the campus here. And for students that uh, participate in that, if they're awarded an Army ROTC scholarship, pretty much for the whatever the term of that scholarship is, they have full tuition and fees, room and board covered. Uh, we're a yellow ribbon school uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so uh, we'll get a lot of students that are using uh, post 9-11 GI Bill benefits here, uh, whether it's the veteran or if they transfer those funds to their, uh, their children, uh, they all can be used here and so forth. And then we accept obviously all the Florida state aid. They have a Bright Future Scholarship Program and they have residency grants and things like that. Uh, and then all the federal forms of financial aid. And we have payment plans and, and various uh, college savings plans can be used here. So these, this packaging process happens after admissions. And again, um, to get a full financial aid package, after admissions, what we need you to do is file a free application for federal student aid, have the information sent to us, and, and we'll build these packages for you. Um, and you'd be pleasantly surprised. We just got to get you to do the paperwork. Okay. Uh, so we talked about uh, for about 36 minutes here. I got about nine minutes left in our session. Uh, I was going to open it up to Dave to see if we had any specific questions out there that, that we can answer uh, live. Dave, do we got anything? Mike, we had one question on advanced placement. Can you go over, you want you to go over the IB process again. What, what do you have to do to bring IB in and what do you get for IB classes? Okay, excellent. And very good question. And if you're enrolled in an IB curriculum, Good on you. I, I would first and foremost, I would tell you that an IB curriculum in high school is probably the most rigorous high school curriculum out there. And the students that are completing IB diplomas uh, are some of the most well prepared students going into universities. We love to see students that are in IB uh, curriculums. But we also realize that that it's some of the toughest. It's very hard to get good grades in a full IB uh, curriculum. And so International Baccalaureate or IB, uh, students have different options. And, and, and for some students, for a lot of students in the United States, if they're in an IB curriculum, what they're trying to achieve is an IB diploma, all right? An IB diploma at the end of graduation from high school. And uh, you have to take you know, exams at the end. And if you're, uh, they don't issue IB diplomas until the summer after you graduate high school. So if you're graduating in May or June, it's typically the end of June, beginning July, uh, uh, before you're notified that you're an IB diploma awardee. And if you get awarded an IB diploma and we get a copy of that diploma, um, the transfer credit is equivalent to about 30 semester hours, 30 college semester hours worth of credit. That's a whole year of college, right? It takes about uh, at minimum 120 credit hours to get a bachelor's of science degree in the United States. Engineering, you're talking 128 to 132 credit hours to get a degree. An IB diploma is worth about 30 credit hours. That's a lot. Now, so if you're an IB diploma candidate and you get that diploma, it's 30 credit hours. It typically covers the maths, calculus one and two, English composition, the sciences, biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, there be, will, there'll be humanities type classes involved in that. And it's all added up together to be about 30 credit hours, which are a lot of the first year level academic courses that you have to take in college. Now, some students are taking IB classes they're not an IB diploma candidate, but they, their, their school offers the international baccalaureate program and the students are just signed up for one, two, three or four IB classes, maybe more. Uh, and they're, they're not gonna be a diploma candidate, but they have the opportunity to take what's called the IB higher level examination. They have IB standard level, SL, and IB higher level, HL. And if a student gets up to the IB HL higher level, 
and they take the IB higher level examination at the end, there's a scoring scale. It goes one through seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so you can get advanced standing credit in college at this one if you score a four or higher, four, five, six, or seven. If you're just taking the higher level examinations, you'll get advanced standing credit or transfer credit for that, whatever that subject matter is. So if you're in the IB higher level math, which is calculus level mathematics, and you get a four or higher, you can get credit for calculus one and calculus two. Does that make sense? Uh, but it's just for those subject matters. And so it depends on what you're doing. Again, in the United States, some people are diploma candidates and some are just taking the higher level IB classes. So you tell us what you're doing and you provide us your scores or your diploma. We'll, we'll get you the advanced standing credit. Good question. What else, Dave? Do I have to live on campus? Oh, excellent. The answer is yes. Uh, unless you're a local student, unless your family lives within uh, a 50 mile radius uh, of our campus and you can commute, uh, anybody else has to live on campus for at least their first two years. We have a, a two year residency requirement. Uh, and so uh, after the first two years, <clears throat> it's your choice. You can stay on campus all four years if you want, but after your, your sophomore year, you tell us what you wanna do. Stay on campus or I'm moving off campus. We have five apartment complexes and seven residence halls as part of university uh, housing and so forth. So the apartment complexes, uh, you know, each student has their own room and they may share a common living room and kitchen. And, and freshman apartments, we have two, two, two of the apartments that are designated as freshman apartments uh, and they're uh, four bedroom apartments. Um, the residence halls are like dormitory style living where uh, it's typically two to a room uh, and each, each floor and wing uh, of a residence hall has 10 students. They have five rooms with two students in them. Now, what's changed this last year is that because of the pandemic uh, and we've been conducting in-person classes, we, we have not closed down. So our students are here in person. Uh, they're taking classes or doing labs and so forth. Um, uh, but in order to, to try to ensure or increase everybody's safety, we've, we've changed our residence halls this last year to one person per room. So even though they're set up for two people per room, <clears throat> um, it, right now it's one person per room in the residence halls. And if you're in an apartment, each student has their own room, but they may share a common living room and, and kitchen. And so I'm gonna expand on that, Dave, a little bit to talk about what we're doing uh, uh, for the pandemic. Uh, like I mentioned, we haven't really uh, shut down at all. Uh, we've been in full operations uh, for the entire year uh, here in Florida. Uh, our students are in the classroom. We've actually given students the option uh, so we have a hybrid model. You can uh, be here in person in the class or, or you can attend the classes via remote access if you wanna do that. So all the classes are simulcast and they're recorded. So uh, you could be in your dorm room and, and, and look at the class or you could be in the classroom itself. Uh, right now, everybody on campus is wearing, they're wearing masks when they're in the classrooms. Uh, uh, they're exercising proper social distancing. Uh, we have hand washing stations all over the place. Uh, and, it, and in all reality, it's actually working uh, very well. We've had very few cases of actual positive cases of COVID-19 in the entire year on campus. I think right now we're tracking two students, two students that, that tested positive for COVID-19 currently. One's on campus, one's off campus, they're both quarantined. Not one person has gone to the hospital, thankfully. None of our professors uh, uh, have either. Uh, and so forth, but we've taken a very measured approach uh, to keep everybody safe and it's working. Uh, so, um, uh, but if you're, if you're coming down uh, to campus uh, for the first two years, you gotta live on campus. Afterwards, you tell us what you wanna do. All right, Dave, I think we have maybe time for one more quick question. Uh, can I visit campus? Yes, you can visit campus. Very good question. We are doing in-person uh, visits daily. Again, a measured approach. Uh, you can go to our website, and go to admissions and, and click visit. There's a visit button there and it will give you what the availability is. Uh, we are doing five sessions a day, only five families at a time. And it's booking up pretty quick. Come visit us. Folks, thank you so much. Dave and I enjoyed it. And I'm gonna hand it back to Clarissa. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting us for this event, Clarissa.
Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all that information with us. And thank you everyone for joining us as well to take in all that wonderful information. When you do close this window, there will be a link to a very quick four question survey. And we would appreciate any feedback you can give us. This is also just one of many sessions happening. There's an additional one next hour. So definitely go check that out. And by tomorrow, this session's recording will be available in case you guys missed anything or wanted to catch up on anything. Again, thank you. And we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thanks.